Rejoice, everybody. Rejoice. So this is what uh, everybody's talking about. So we just knew that we had to get these for everybody because Jesus commanded. We had a whole teaching on it on rejoicing, so I'm not going to get into that. But Jesus, when he was resurrected, the very first words that he said when he saw people, he said, rejoice. And that word is prophetic, and it's loaded. There's so much depth behind that word, so you don't have to understand it. It's because the Holy Spirit is behind it. So when you say that word uh, out loud, there is angels are going out and doing all kinds of things. Like all kinds of things are happening in the spiritual world. So I think it's really important. So if you have not gotten one of these, if you're, these are for adults, if you have not want, gotten one of these, then after church, we got more of them. We want to make sure that everybody has these. And so every time you're drinking your coffee, this is the news that you're getting. You're looking at it and you're like, rejoice. Okay, I'm going to rejoice. So this is Jesus' words for you. Remember, these are not our words. These are Jesus' words. And he's the one that is saying that to us. And so we're starting a new year. It's really exciting. I believe that this year is going to be the best year up to, you know, from now, up to now. I believe that every year is supposed to get better and better for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the world, things are getting worse. For us, things are getting better. And so every year I look at my final statement, and since I got a hold of this message um, in 2008, so this is my 15th year that I look at my statement, and now this is the 15th year that I beat my previous financial record. So... This really works. Believing in the truth and believing that God is good really works. And so that's why we're excited to teach this truth. And um, it's not just theory. It's proven truth that if you apply it, I can boldly come up here and say that if you apply this word, it will work. It's guaranteed. And the more that you're in it, it becomes to, uh, it gets to a point in your life to where you're expecting it. Just like any one of you sits down to eat at a table, you're expecting that food's going to be there for you to eat, right? You're not sitting there wondering if it's going to happen or not. You have an expectation. That proves that you believe for that thing, right? For whatever it is that you're believing, you're expecting it. And so as Christians, the issue is that we don't believe because it has never worked for us. So we say it, um, and then we, we're hoping, but we don't believe. Hope and believe are two different things. Hoping that something's going to happen is not believing that something's going to happen. Amen? You know, I hope that I might eat after church. That's not going to get me anywhere. I believe that I'm going to eat after church. That's going to get me somewhere. So when I believe that I'm going to do that, I'm going to get there and eat and, and, you know, and do what needs to happen in order for me to eat it. Why? Because I believe it. And so this is how spiritual things are supposed to become to us. They're supposed to become very practical, real, and we expect it. If God said, we expect it. Amen? And so we talked about uh, so divine health plan. We did that last year. And there is historical records that show that uh, churches that did that went for 15, 20 years. I mean, after that, they, I don't know, there was no records past that. But for the years that they recorded, it wasn't just individual people. It was churches that participated in this truth. Nobody would get sick and nobody would die prematurely. We also have biblical uh, references, and we're going to be looking at some of those scriptures. And so what my goal is to kind of... Uh, recap um, and reset expectations that every single person here has a divine health plan. In that divine health plan, you have divine health, meaning you are, if you have anything wrong with you, you get rid of that, and then you become 100% healthy, and you stay healthy day after day after day after day. If a symptom attacks, 
You say no to it, and we'll go through some practical steps how we do that. And then you just stand on that and not allow anything to come on you. Amen? So when you go to a restaurant, I mean, sometimes that happens to where you show up and they tell you, like, oh, we're already closed. You know, sometimes, like, you believe that you're going to eat, right? But sometimes there is hiccups. So same thing in divine health plan. Sometimes the enemy would send a symptom, and if you immediately say no, then it goes away. And then the more that you stand on that, the longer, the more amount of time that passes by, the easier it gets. Now, the point that Sam made is that when you start something new, Jesus talked about the parable of the, uh, of the sower and reaper, right? So every time that a new seed is planted, the enemy always comes to steal. He wants you to stop. So it's really important to understand. It's a spiritual principle. Jesus laid it out. When you start something, it is typically there's resistance. The enemy wants you to stop because he knows that if you get a hold of the truth and then that seed um, starts growing roots and it grows into a tree, at that point, the enemy cannot do anything, right? Everything starts at the seed level. When the seed is planted, that's when the enemy tries to steal it. And so that's really important. And as long as we understand that, then we just, the only thing we need to do is continue to stand and not bow down to the lies of the enemy. And so the scripture that I want to start out with and kind of want to lay out this year how things are supposed to be. And if you decide how they will be for you, if you decide, but everything goes back to you. As we teach here, God already did everything from his point of view. Everything's done. He's not doing anything new. It's a matter of you getting revelation of what he has already done and applying that in your life. And so Isaiah 53, uh, God starts out and he says, who has believed our report? It's a question mark. So God is asking you today, do you believe his report? So who has believed his report? That means that not everybody believes the report. So the Bible is very, very straightforward, and it lays out clear instructions. It's like the more that I read it, the more clear it gets. So God made everything simple. So um, there is a report that he puts out. So what is God's report? This is God's report. So God's word is his report. So he put out a report. He settled it, right? In the DHT, we go over that his word is settled forever. So he stamped it. He put it on record. It's done. Like he has put out his final report. Everybody understand what the final report is, right? A final report is unchangeable. That means it's done. There will be no more reports. God is not going to change his word. So the final report is this. It's settled. It's done. So when the final report is issued, it's done. It's settled. This is the final report. God stamped it, approved it. He's good with it. He also said that his word will not come back void, right? So that means that his report is not void. When you speak his report, when you agree to his report, it always works, 100%. So because God is God, he does not lie, that means if he said it, it is it, it's final. So if there is an issue, it comes back to us, not on God. As far as God is concerned, it's done. So now what that means is we have to figure out what the report is and then believe it. Because he starts out with a question, and this is a question that I want you to start out this year. Who has believed our report? So God is asking you, who has believed his report? Okay, so Sam's believing Jackie, two people, good. Anybody else wants to believe his report? If you believe his report, stand up. Almost everybody. <laughs> Okay. So repeat after me. Father God, Father God right now, right now at, uh, 12 .06 PM, at 12 .06 PM, on this day, on this day I, proclaim I proclaim into the spiritual world, into the spiritual world that, I 
that I choose, that I choose to, believe your report. to believe your report. Okay? So grab a seat. So something just happened in the spiritual world. You declared. Declarations into the spiritual world are very, very powerful. So you did not just think about it. So thinking about something, does that change anything? So if you sit there and think about something, does that change anything? So if you're sitting there and you're thinking about something that I'm going to do for you, am I going to do it? Most likely not. I mean, sometimes if the Holy Spirit, you know, will show me and then like, so it works that way. But just like, if you take the spirit realm out of it, just in the physical realm, if you're thinking about something and don't tell me, it's not going to happen, right? And so this is what happens with a lot of people is they think about stuff, they hear stuff, they'll hear a sermon, they'll hear a teaching, and they're like, mm, this is really good. You know, they'll just think about it and that's it. Is that thought going to change anything? Absolutely not. So you have to declare what you believe. You have to proclaim what you believe. You have to agree. So when God says, who has believed our report, he's putting out a call. And so then you decide what you're going to do with that call. And so when he says something, so every time that we teach something or that we cover a part of his report. So every time that I read scripture, I am delivering to you not my thoughts and ideas. I'm delivering to you God's report. And then God is always asking. Every time that you hear God's report, he always asks the question. And the question is, who has believed our report? He's looking for who. So when he says, who has believed our report... Who qualifies here to be a who? Every person, right? So that means he doesn't say like, hey, Bob, do you believe my report? It's not just for Bob or, you know, this person or for, for John or for this person. It's for who? Whomsoever, correct? So that means the report goes out to everybody. Everybody has access to it. The same Report goes out to every single person. So every single person, it doesn't matter what color you are, what age you are, what nationality you are. If you're a male or a female, we only believe in two. Uh, that, that, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. Every single person who chooses to believe God's report can decide, this is what I believe. I'm going to share a quick testimony. So... Um, there were some healing conferences happening here in the U.S., and a lady came to get prayed for, and she had a tumor on her face. So she had a big tumor on her face, and she came, and the preacher was teaching that by his stripes you are healed. And so she came up to the preacher, and he didn't even say if he prayed for her or not, but he asked her a question. Well, actually, he said to her, by his word, you are healed. And she sat there and she repeated after him, by his word, I am healed. And she left. Nothing happened on the spot. She left. Ten days later, she comes back and her face is completely clear. Everything's gone. No signs of that tumor. And if you can imagine a tumor, like it grows part, like if you cut it out, you're going to have a wound. So she came back, it was completely clear, and she testified and she said that when she would be washing the dishes, she would say, by his word, I am healed. By his word, I am healed. She'd go to sleep saying that, she'd wake up saying that, she'd be driving saying that, everything that she was doing, she just kept saying it, and the more that she said it, it became real to her, and what was she doing? She was answering God's call. God says, whose report are you going to believe? Or actually, who has believed that report? And what she's answering is that I believe the report. By his, by his word, I am healed. By his word, I am healed. By his word, I am healed. And as she was saying that, the thing fell off and she looked in the mirror and nothing was there. She believed the report. So remember one thing. 
that God's report is the final report. It cannot be changed, and it works 100%. It cannot not work. God put his whole kingdom, everything behind it. He put it above himself. And we teach that during the DHT, like how much God values his report. Like this is the best report out there. There is no other report. A lot of people wait for financial reports. A lot of people wait for stock reports, right? People wait for a newspaper to see how the stocks did, how this did. You know, like everybody's always looking for reports. Some people are obsessed with reports. <laughs> And so we know some people that are really obsessed with reports. And so, but the only report that matters is the final report of God. Because this is the only one that will change your life. And there are some truths in here that if you just keep saying them, think about that. So that lady probably had a report from the doctor that said, you need chemo to get that off. You need this. You need this. You need this. I'm pretty sure some people told her you're going to die. She had all kinds of reports. She had multiple options, multiple reports. And she chose to believe the report, the only report. And so in this year, God is asking you, who has believed that report? So you have a choice to believe his report. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter how last year was for you. Um, for me, it was great. It was amazing. It was an amazing year. No matter what was going on, you know, who was the president, who wasn't, none of that affected me. Inflation did not affect me. My income rose and I was blessed. Why? Because I believe this report. And we're going to look at some verses in here. I don't know how many we're going to be able to get through today. If not, we'll be going through continuing next Sunday. But there are some, re there are some sections of this report that are just, just so amazing. When you look at them, you can take one of those and your life will drastically change. This lady took one verse, by his stripes I'm healed, Isaiah 53. And just like that, the thing fell off. That's how simple. And all she had to do is speak the report. All she had to do is just believe that report. And the way you prove that you believe something is you repeat it. You speak on it and you stand on it. Now, some people will say, well, I did. And usually when we ask somebody, they'll say like, well, I stood on it for five minutes. For five minutes, I believed and it didn't work. Some people say, oh, brother, you don't understand how spiritual I am. I went for three hours, I stood on it and it didn't work. You know, how dare does God, you know, he doesn't, you know, say the truth in his word. And so people put time on it. This lady decided, because afterwards she testified, that she will stand on that truth until she gets the result. So you have to remember that God is outside of time. God, doesn't, God, God does not know how many minutes or whatever. He doesn't operate in time. We operate in time. For God, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years in one day. So we, we make up the time. But what we've learned is that if we remove time and just believe the report, and how do you believe the report? Don't back off of it. Just keep standing. And this is why the divine health plan that we're trying to roll out, we're trying to make it very practical to where every single person is making that decision daily to renew that stand, to renew the proclamation and declaration that, God, I believe your report, by your stripes I'm healed, I have divine health. To where you're daily reminding yourself, to where it's not just a one-time event, it's a lifestyle. God's life is not events, it's a lifestyle. So it has to be continuous. It's not just one time. Healing is one time. And so we believe in healing, that's good. But what we want is what God wants, and that is divine health, to where you get healed and then you never get sick. That is what God's will is. God does not want people to get sick, to get healed, to get sick, to be healed. God wants people to get well and be well all the time to have your finances, and to never lack. Like, God does not have lack in anything. So this principle applies in your health, in your finances, in your joy, in your peace, and everything. When he gives, he has abundance. Remember that Jesus said, I give you life and life abundant. It's packed. 
He has no, in him there is nothing. And what I've learned this year, that the more that I walk around and tell people how good God is, he is just proving to me day after day how good he is. That the miraculous things that happened in my life this year, I mean, I could write a book on it and it wouldn't fit. How many good things have happened? Just because I believe the report that God is good. That he's a good father. I believe for myself, and I started that on Father's Day last year. I mean, I kind of believed it, but I really started, I started proclaiming and started believing the report that God is good. That means that there is nothing bad in him. God does not do anything bad. He does not make anybody sick. He does not allow bad things to happen. He has nothing to do with anything bad. He does not allow these earthquakes to happen, these tornadoes to happen. He's not the one that's causing these floods in California right now. He has nothing to do with that. Zero. Why? Because his report says that there is no darkness in him. And somebody's house getting washed away and being destroyed, people are tormented in fear. That is not light. That is darkness. And there is no darkness in God. So that means he can't participate in that. He has zero participation in that. Who does all of those bad things? Satan. It clearly states, Jesus said himself, he made it very clear. His report says, I came to give life and life abundant. He did not say, I came to judge you. He also said that I did not come to judge. He said that I came to give you life and life abundant. He did not say, I came here to create tornadoes. I did not come here to create earthquakes. I did not come here to kill you for your sins. He never said any of those words. None of those words ever came out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus said, I came to give life and life abundant. That is his report. And then he said, just so nobody's confused and can't take it out of context, because, well, just because Jesus didn't say it, he didn't mean it, he made it very clear. He said, but the devil comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So anything that's stealing, killing, and destroying, and so when a flood is happening and somebody's uh, sofa is floating into the ocean, that's stealing. So can Jesus be doing that? No. So if you decide just that truth, just that one report, where Jesus said, I came to give life and life abundant, the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, it will drastically change your life because now the devil cannot steal anything from you. Why? Because you don't believe that anymore. But as long as you, can, as long as you keep believing, yeah, some people will say, well, maybe God will not give you that sickness, but he sure is allowing it. That is the same as doing it. There is no difference. That's guilty by participation. But Jesus made it very clear. Stealing, killing, and destroying is of the devil. All darkness is of the devil. God is light. God is life. That's it. It's that simple. Choose to believe that report for yourself. I'm a walking testimony. I chose to believe that, and I saw so many amazing things happen and I'm so excited to see what's going to happen this year because this year it's going to be better and better and better. Why? Because I believe that my father is good. The father who's my father, Father God, I chose to believe his report that he said I came to give life and life abundant. That's it. It's that simple. So you decide what you're going to believe. You decide whose report you're going to believe. So when somebody comes to you and says... So we get a lot of emails. People say, well, the doctor said I have cancer. The doctor said this. And so they're trying to tell me what the doctor says. Well, guess what? I could care less what the doctor says. I decided to believe this as the final report. My doctor, Jesus Christ, says that by his stripes I'm healed. And so when people want to start talking doctors, and God bless them, I don't have anything against them, but for me, Jesus is the one by his stripes I'm healed. And so if we choose that, that is what we're going to have. God is continuously asking every person, who will believe my report? Who will believe to my report? And the thing is, not only that, what's interesting here in this verse, it says, who 
has believed our report. So there's a time when you're believing report, his report, and there's a time that you have believed. So there is a transitional period. When you get to a point that you has believed his report, meaning that you have already believed his report, it will be working for you already. When you're in the process of believing the report, you're growing in that, or you're starting to believe, or you're acknowledging, deciding to believe. So there is different steps in it. Do you guys see that? So who has believed that report? So God wants all of us to be in the position that we have already believed the report. So to have believed the report, this is something that we have to start. If we haven't yet, you have to start, and you keep standing on it until it starts working, and then it will continue working. So when something already starts working in your life, you transition from having to believe his report or believe in his report to have already believed, to past tense. Because remember what Peter says, by his stripes you were healed. So the final report on healing that Apostle Peter delivered, it's already, it has passed, it has already been, been done because Isaiah said that it's coming, Jesus said that it's here, in Matthew 8, and Peter said that it has happened already. It's past tense. You were healed already. It's done. It's settled. That's the report. So believe that. So if you believe that, so let's go back to say like a practical example. So if I say that I'm going to give you $1,000, if I say... Natalie, I'm going to give you $1,000. Well, never mind. She already has my $1,000. So Sam, I'm going to give you $1,000. If I say, Sam, I'm going to give you $1,000. Sam is in the waiting state, right? He cannot go to his bank and say, hey, give me my $1,000. Right? Or if I say, hey, Sam, let's go to the bank I'm giving you $1,000. That transition to Matthew. So when I say I'm going to give you, or it's coming, it's in the future state. That was Isaiah 53. In Matthew 8, where it says, Jesus said that it's already, like this is his word fulfilled. Jesus is already here to do that. That means that we're going to the bank to deposit it. And then in Peter, because it was already past the whipping post, it's already done. So then, I, then Sam already knows and says like, hey, it's already in the bank. Then he can go and demand it. So if it's in the past state, is he going to be coming to me to ask for the $1,000? Or is he going to the bank to ask the $1,000? To the bank. Okay? So now you see how most people's answers are a waste of time because they're asking God to give them something. When you come to God and you say, God, heal me. When he said, I have already healed you, it's already done. So that's why when you're praying a prayer like that, God cannot answer that prayer. Because that's not what his report says. His report says it's done. He says I already healed you. So what that means is now you go confront that sickness. Hey, pain in my foot? What are you doing here? Jesus has already paid the price. Divine health is supposed to be here. So get out. This is past tense prayer. It's not even a prayer, it's a command. You're already claiming what you have. This is the difference. If you believe or you think that the report says that it's coming, you have not read the whole report. Because the report ends that it's done. It's already finished. The final report is that it's already done. So that means when it comes to sickness and disease, it's past tense. It's, already, it's over. It's settled. As far as God is concerned... You don't need to ask him. So because a lot of times we'll come to minister to somebody, and so the religious people will pull me to the side, um, and I'll say, hey, brother, did you get a word? I'm like, what word? <laughs> did God already finish teaching him something? Like, wh wh what kind of leader are you? You don't even understand how to get the word. I'm like, no, I didn't even ask. They're like, well, what are you doing here praying? I said, because I read that it's already done. I don't need to ask. 
I came here to settle it. I came to the bank to say, hey, where's the money? Because the money is already there. The healing is already here. So we come to enforce what's already done, not looking for something. We don't need to pray to God for healing. So if you're asking God, God, heal me. God, heal me. God, show me mercy. You know, God, do this for me. That prayer can never be answered. That, those words are void. Because that is not, that proves that you don't believe the report. Because God is asking, he says, who has believed, has believed the report? So to get results, who has believed the report? You have to believe what the report says. And the report says that it's already done. And it also says that when Jesus came, it says, of his fullness we have received. That means we have already, like if you become saved, you, re you receive of his fullness. You have everything. You have peace. You have joy. God gives you everything. He does not hold anything back. If he gives you Jesus, he gives you the fullness of Jesus. You have everything. You have, it's, it's done. So now don't be asking God for it. Start thanking him for it. And start telling, commanding that thing. So if God says that I give you peace, because what did Jesus say? Peace I give you. He didn't say, I'm only going to give peace to these people or these people. He said, peace I give you. He spoke the words. It's in, it's, it's in the report. The report says, peace I give you. So if you don't have peace, that means you have not dealt with the worry and anxiety. There is no room in your house for that peace. Because you are allowing fear, worry, and anxiety to manifest. So what you need to do is you need to boot out the things that are not supposed to be there saying, Jesus' name, fear, worry, anxiety, you are not of God in Jesus' name, go. Jesus said, I have peace, and I receive this peace, I have this peace. Peace abides in me, and you walk around and you start thanking God, Father God, I thank you. Your report says that Jesus said... I give you peace. I receive this peace. I have this peace. When I receive Jesus, I receive peace with it. I received everything else with it. And you start proclaiming that report. That answers God's call. Because when you're saying that, God looks at it like, yep, believes my report. And when you believe his report, it's guaranteed. It cannot not work. It is impossible for the report not to work if you choose to believe it. That is not my words. I'm just saying what God says. And I feel very confident saying what God says. Because I decided, even if none of this worked, I decided that I'm going to stand on this word for the rest of my life, and I'd rather come to heaven and say, Father God, I was obedient. Maybe I didn't understand everything. Maybe it didn't work for me. Obedience supersedes everything. Obedience supersedes results. But the good news is that obedience leads to results every time. So starting with obedience and obedience to believe his report will lead to good results. Amen? So I want to read a few scriptures on his report. So some of them we already covered in the past, but I think it's really, really important. So these are the reports. Write them down. This is what God says. These are not my words. This is what God says. And this is in the Old Testament. The first report is what he said when he created people. So this was prior to the devil stealing what, what God has given to people. So in Genesis 1.26... So I, I love these verses because these verses is what our church is called for. Okay? So it says in 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. That's where Dominion Life Church. So God said, let, us, let them have dominion. So God has given us dominion. So because God has given us dominion, this is who we are. We have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And all the demons and devils, that, these are the things that creep on this, on this earth right now. So we have dominion over everything. Sickness, disease, all that. The only thing that we do not have dominion over is people. We cannot 
Manipulate, control, dominate people. That is not allowed. The only one that does that is the devil. Demonic spirits do that. God does not allow us to to do that. The only thing we're allowed to do with people is to love on people and serve people. That's what Jesus did. When he came, he served people. He set them free. But over everything else, we have dominion over. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That means everything that you do, you are to be fruitful and multiplying. God's expectation that you're multiplying, your money is multiplying, your peace is multiplying, everything is multiplying. Not just adding, but multiplying. And if God said to be fruitful and multiply, can he ever run out of things for you to be fruitful and multiply in? No. That's why I say that when you start believing God and you start believing that he's good and you start believing his report, it just gets better and better. There is no end to it. And the good thing is that the things in God that are multiplying, it cannot be taken away from you. God will never take anything away from you. So who comes to steal? The devil. The only one that wants to steal from you is the devil. So that song that everybody sings, he gives and he takes away, do not ever sing that again. Those are the words of the devil, according to Jesus. God said, be fruitful and multiply. He has already given it to you. Now he's telling you what to do with it. So that means he can never take it away. If you believe that, and if you sing that, you're proclaiming that. Every time that you say he gives and he takes away, demons are rejoicing. Because they're like, all right, boys, let's go. Let's go get everything from them. Let's go get it. Their health, let's go get it. Their, whatever they have, their house, their job, let's go get it. This fool decided to believe us. That's what the Bible says. The Bible calls us people that believe the devil are fools. Right? If you look at the scripture, if you believe the devil, you are a fool. That's what the Bible says. These are not my words. I know it's harsh, but it's foolish to believe the devil. People's lives are getting destroyed because they're choosing to believe the devil. God said, be fruitful and multiply. So what we are to do, walk around and say, Father God, I thank you that you said, your report said, I am to be fruitful and I'm to multiply in everything. That means my job is prospering. My family is prospering. Things are getting better. Every day things are going to get better. That's what fruitful and multiplying is. Is there any subtractions and multiplication? He did not say one day you're going to multiply, next day you're going to divide, or you're going to... So who divides and conquers? Satan. There is no division in God. God only said, fruitful and multiply. Believe what he said. Let him figure out how to fulfill that in your life. Don't worry about that. I'm not worried about how, like sometimes I think, how much better can it get? I'm not worried about it. I'm like, God, you know how to do that. You are God. You will figure out how to multiply me and how to make me more fruitful. You cannot run out of that. I'm just excited waking up every day, seeing what he's going to do. Because I just choose to believe the report. Now, people call me a fool for believing that. But God keeps proving to me that, he's, that I'm not. And I just choose to stand and stand and stand. And it's really fun. Because having a relationship with God, believing what he said, is really good. So, and he makes it very easy. And it says, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in 31, it says, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So he was very happy with his job. He did a job. He created people, he gave him dominion, he spoke what's supposed to happen, and he looked at it, 
It looks very good. He's very happy with it. So God approved his plan. He said it one time, he repeated again, and then he backed it by saying that it's very good. So another scripture. So in the Old Testament, so the first three verses that we wrote, that we read, were written prior to Satan entering. So this was his original plan. The plan for us today in Christ Jesus is even better than that. Because remember, this was pre-Jesus, but that was to a man that has not been fallen. So for those who are in Christ Jesus, it's even better. Now let's look at what he said to people that were in the old covenant. People that had no relationship with him, they had to live by the law. Look at all the good things he told them. So we can take this and multiply it because we're in Christ Jesus. So for them, they had curses and blessings. Can we have cursings? Impossible because Jesus said that he went on the cross and so the curses went with him. He took the curse upon himself. If you are in Christ Jesus, you cannot be cursed. So that means we can look in here and take all the blessings. It's part of the report. Look what he says. So Exodus chapter 15, in verse 26, the last part of it says, For I am the Lord who heals you. So God is a healer. He did not say, I am the Lord who makes you sick. He says, I am the Lord who heals you. He said that under the old covenant. So we are to take these words and believe. Amen? We can, can we take these words? Yeah. Because it's a blessing. All blessings come through Christ Jesus. Next one. Exodus 23 Verses, starting in verse 25. So you shall serve the Lord your God. So for them, their requirements, they were to serve the Lord. We are to believe in Jesus Christ, right? So we are in a covenant. So they had a covenant, Old Testament covenant. Our covenant is in Christ Jesus. So for covenant people, so who here is a covenant person? Everybody is. If you are saved, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are in a covenant with Jesus, and God has a covenant with you through Jesus. You don't have a covenant with God. Jesus does, and you're in Him, so you have Jesus' covenant with God. You have the best covenant possible. These people could mess up their covenant. That's why for us, we can only take the blessings because we cannot mess up our covenant. Because our covenant is based on Jesus. So we have the best deal, the, the best package. And it says, and he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sicknesses away from the midst of you. So God is saying to the new covenant people that I will take sicknesses from the midst of you. That means there should be, this is a midst of people here. Okay, if we believe this report... There'll be no sicknesses. It's not just for each individual person. It's for midst of people. So nobody here, as a new covenant person, according to this report, should be sick. None, no one shall suffer miscarriage. Look, this, these are God's words. This is what's supposed to happen. So if you are having miscarriages, that means you are believing the lie of the devil. That means somebody said, if you do this and this, you will miscarry. That means at some point, you believed lies. Because God says, if you're a covenant per person, it says, no one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. These are the words of God. So that means people in the new covenant shall not experience not having to be able to have kids. So if that has been happening, 
Grab this report and start standing on it. God, you said. You can go to him and say, God, you said, I believe your report. You can come boldly to God with his report and stand on it. Now, don't whine and complain if it doesn't get answered in five minutes. Stand on it. You have the right to stand on it. And how long do you stand? Till you have your child. Because God said, no one. Okay? How many people can have miscarriages in no one? Zero. So God put out a report and said, no one. This is the truth. These are some really bold words. So what you take out of this, you say, I believe by the word, by the word, by his word, I'm having a child. By his word, I'm healed. By his word, my finances are blessed. By his word, I'm multiplying. By his word, I'm being fruitful. You just stand on that. You take his report and you fulfill all kinds of scriptures here. You're fulfilling the scripture. You're fulfilling what he, the question. You're fulfilling like, like it all just starts working. Why? Because now you're in alignment with his word. And it's so, when I was reading this, I was just so, like my spirit was so excited. And it also says here, I... So God himself will fulfill the number of your days. So your days will be fulfilled. Your days will be blessed. Because God himself will fulfill your days. How does he fulfill them? He already said what's supposed to happen. You just walk around and say, speak it. Father God, I thank you I'm multiplying. I thank you that I'm not aging. I thank you that every day I'm getting younger, I'm getting stronger, I'm more healthier. You just walk around and you just speak and speak and speak what he says. And you keep saying that until it starts manifesting in your life. That will transition you to a person who has believed his report. If you say it one time and then it doesn't happen, because again, what does the devil do when a seed? So right now we planted a seed, a seed went out. So God's word went out, a seed went out. If you've never heard this before, this is a seed going out. If you're going to take it, the enemy will come to steal it from you. Guaranteed. Jesus said that. Not my words, Jesus' words. That's the way the spiritual world works. The devil will try to come to steal it from you. You have a decision to make. You will allow him to steal it from you and never get this fulfilled in your life. Or you will not allow him to steal it from you and turn it into has believed. And has believed is when you see what you're looking for. If God says that this is what he promised, it is his will. It is not you wondering, what is, is God's will for me to have a child or not? Is God's will for me to have a divine health or not? Is God's will for me to be blessed or not? That's double mindedness. That guarantees, if you're wondering what God's will for your life is, that is a guarantee you will get nothing. You will never have anything from God. Why? Because the Bible says you are double-minded, and a double-minded person cannot receive anything from the Lord. That's what the Scripture says. Right? So the Scripture is very clear. It's very simple. And so our job is to learn and to stand. We learn and we stand until we see the result. And it transitions from believing to has believed because it starts to manifest in our life. That is what God's will is. So some people, a lot of people come to me like, well, I don't know what God's will for me is. What well, I don't know that. Well, it's like open the report. It's in the report. It's already done. It's settled. If anybody wants to know what God's will for you is, it's in here. If you don't know how to figure it out for yourself, come to one of our ministers. We'll help you. We can boldly say, to anybody what God's will for you is. Why? Because it's already written. It's, it's not my interpretation of it. I will just read to you what God says. So right now I'm telling you what God's will for you is. God's will for you is to be fruitful to multiply. 
God's will for you is to have children. God's will is for you to have divine health. God's will is for you to be blessed. God's will for you is to be victorious. God's will is for you to be full of peace, full of joy, full of life. God's will is for you is to prosper in everything that you do. That is God's will. I can boldly speak without any hesitation what his will is because I am reading in his report. It wasn't somebody told me. I see it, I believe it, and it's working in my life. It's not theory. We have tested this. You heard Sam's testimony. He believed the report, decided to the divine health plan, and for 11 months, he's been victorious. That's how it works. It's that simple. It's not theory. God is not into theory. God is not a professor. God is very, very practical. What does the Bible say? People that are full of knowledge, it puffs them up, right? So if somebody's after knowledge and all they want is knowledge, who is that from? The devil. So God is not into knowledge. God is into practical application. He put out a report. He laid out his will. He wants us to believe it, stand on it, and get to a spot where it has. It's past tense for us. He already did it. For him, it's already past tense. He's waiting for it till it becomes past tense for us. And for that to come, the practical application, you start speaking it and remove time. So if you have something in your body that's not supposed to be there, decide. From the time you get up to the time you go to sleep, by his word, I'm healed. By his word, Father God, I thank you. By your word, I'm healed. 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 So I practiced that just for fun. So I walked around for like two hours just saying that. My spirit was so stirred up to where I had to stop. I had to stop because it became too overwhelming. That's how strong it is. When you start speaking his word, there's life in his word. And so Jesus came to give us life. And so in his word, there's life and there's results. And so starting this new year, I want everybody to start out with believing his report. So Divine Health Plan, if you want to start participating this year, you get yourself a little planner, a calendar, and if there is something that you had previously, there's some sickness and disease, you put it on the back of the book, and you start going after it, so you get rid of it, and then every day, you're watching and not allowing anything else new to come in. So you're removing the old, and you're not allowing anything new to come in. Now, how do you practically do that? So when you wake up in the morning, and the second that you feel a symptom of anything, you immediately say, no, devil, you're a liar. By his word, I'm healed. That's it. By his word, I'm healed. And don't be passive. Start aggressively going after it, and you will see. And if you did not beat it that day, fight the next day, fight the next day, it doesn't matter. You do not stop. You keep fighting. If it gets too hard, get help. We can help each other. That's what the body of Christ is for. We're there to help each other out. But the goal is that if it took you five days to beat something, next time you reduce it to three, to one, and then it doesn't come. So you're growing. Growth is progressive. So you're growing into developing to, into a spot where it is no longer affecting you whatsoever. It cannot touch you. And so it doesn't matter if it wiped you out once. You get up. It wiped you out again. doesn't matter. You get up. But you keep standing. You keep believing until that word becomes past tense. Now the devil cannot touch you. And you do that with divine health plan, but you can do it with other things. Your finances, whatever it is that you have needs in, you can do the same thing. The same principle applies. But when it comes to divine health, our goal is that every single one here, if there is anything in your body, it's gone, and nobody gets sick. 
That's really important. Here's why. So the people of the devil, one of them is the Microsoft guy, they predicted when COVID is going to come. He already also announced when the next one's coming. And here's what he said. He said the next one, when it's going to come, when people get sick, they will be paralyzed. He is publicly saying that. And nobody's rebuking him. I don't see all of these big evangelists, all of these people that are on TV saying, no, you devil, that's a lie that will not happen. But we are, as Dominion Life Church Portland, are saying in Jesus' name, that will not happen in the midst of us. We are to declare. Why? Because that's what this report says. Just like nobody died of COVID when he said that people are going to die, nobody's going to get paralyzed. It doesn't matter what the devil's doing, but it's not going to be in the midst of us. Why? Because I just read a scripture. And so we have to prepare. We have to get to the spot because the devil is intensifying his stuff. Nobody's going against him. Like, I'm shocked. Like, all of these big preachers, commentators, they will comment on really dumb stuff, like it's irrelevant stuff. But when somebody says the next pandemic is going to do this and this and this, and it's coming into what he even said the year... And then the U.S. government already put up billions of dollars of how they're going to fight it. And the church is, you know, thinking about which McDonald's they're going to go to after church. This is really serious stuff. A lot of people died. COVID took out a lot of Christians. That was a test. Many people failed. They're no longer here in the serve. There are so many pastors that got wiped out. Because they were not ready for it. Why? Because they did not believe the report. They got sick, went to the hospital, and died. Does that line up with God's report? No. Is that supposed to happen to believers? No. We have a choice. We can decide. 2020, 2021, 2022 were really bad years for a lot of people. A lot of people died, got sick, lost everything. But for those that believe the report, it was the best years ever. COVID did not touch me. Why? Because I believe this report. So if God, now I can say like David, when I face Goliath, and when any of us was face Goliath, we can say, God, you did this for me here. You did this for me here. And now I can face this giant and kill him and destroy him. Why? Because you already done it. Every person needs to get to a spot where you know what God has done for you. If God has never done anything for you, if you've never seen him manifest for you, COVID will kill you. All of these things will kill you. Why? Because you have nothing to believe. You have nothing to stand on. While the times are good, every person needs to get to a spot where you believe what God is saying. It has to become real. It has to be manifest in your life. Otherwise, the devil will wipe you out. That's what God is asking. Who will believe my report? Because obviously during Isaiah, during that time, things were really bad. When Isaiah was on this earth, bad things were happening. Israel was in a really bad spot. And so God is asking Isaiah, who believes my report? What's happening? Where is their faith? God is asking the same thing today. Who is believing? Who is going to believe this report? So we have to practice. We have to start getting into it. This is life and death. This is very serious. The things that they're predicting from a human perspective are really bad. And they predicted the previous ones. That means that they're partic- the devil's revealing it to them. They're his children. They're his prophets. They're prophesying what's going to happen. But the church has the report. The church can decide. We do not have to be affected by it. And instead, we need to put an end to it. I want us to be the people that says, God, we believe your report. And in your name, we declare that that is not going to happen. So whatever Bill Gates prophesied in Jesus' name, it will not happen. You are a liar. The spirit behind it, you are a liar. That is the truth. That's what God's word says. Man, and if we stand on that word, we will see amazing things happening to us. So right now we're going to do communion. 
So let's all stand up. Are you guys getting anything? I'm very excited <laughs> about this year. And I really hate the devil. And um, seeing what he's doing, ministering to people, seeing what the devil's doing, it makes me very angry with the devil. It makes me very angry with religion, that religion is allowing it to happen and is not doing anything about it. And so exciting news is that we can do something about it. We're not hopeless. We have believing in Jesus Christ. And so what Jesus said, so communion is a practical thing. We practice it. We do it every Sunday. But the purpose of it is that you learn how to do it continuously. Jesus, we're going to read. And again, so this is where people read it. So if the word said, thus says the Lord, on every first Sunday of the month, you are to do communion. Does it say that? No. People decided to do it once a month. If you do something once a month, you will never remember it. When I used to do it once a month, um, it meant nothing to me. Actually, I was really scared to do communion. It did more bad for me than good because the way I was taught and presented. But what Jesus said, in verse 19, it says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that means that every time that we eat, we are to remember something. What are we to remember? We are to remember that by his stripes we are healed. So that way, it's so real to you that you can walk around and say, by his word, I am healed. Proactively. Don't wait till you get sick. Divine health plan is when you're doing it proactively where its sickness is not touching you. And so if you do communion the way you're supposed to, by remembering that Jesus' body was broken for you, you will never get sick. A symptom will come on and you will say, no devil, you're a liar. It is written by his word, by his word, by his word. Man, you just say what the Bible says. So that's communion is crucial for the body of Christ. Don't wait to do it once a month. Do communion every time that you eat. And say it out loud. If you're, if you're in an area where you can say it out loud, say, Father God, I thank you. I'm going to eat this piece of pizza right now. And as I'm eating it, I'm remembering that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And this piece of pizza is going to bring me nourishment. Vitamins are going to be created inside of it because they don't exist <laughs> for real. <laughs> There's going to be a miracle of multiplication. It's going to produce fruit. This pizza is going to grow vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin Z, whatever vitamins you need. That's what the word says, right? Isn't that what I read? You are to be fruitful and multiply. So multiply everything. Multiply whatever you need, whatever your body needs. You multiply, and it comes by believing, you speaking. When you're multiplying something, it's not there. Jesus multiplied the fish, multiplied the bread. So that means if there is only one vitamin in there, you can multiply it to a million by speaking it. And the way you do it, Father God, I thank you. As I'm eating this, this is bringing me health. This is bringing me nourishment. Everything that I need is in, in this piece of food here. And it's going to be good for me. And you take it and you say, Father God, I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And you practice that, and you practice that, and you practice that. And the only thing that you will remember is, I am healed, I am healed, I am healed. So when you get a symptom of something that goes against that word, you're so grounded in the fact that you're healed, and it's so alive inside of you, where nothing else can come. It, it has no chance. Amen? So that is what God teaches us through communion. It's very practical. So if we have a sickness or we have something, 
we kick it out, and then we proactively speak life and health over us to where it cannot come in. So pick up your cracker and say, Father God, I have believed your report that Jesus said that every time you break bread, I remember that Jesus' body was broken for me. By his stripes, I am healed. If there is any sicknesses in my body, in Jesus' name, go and never come back. You see, we're not asking God. We're not saying, God, oh, please heal me, because we already believed. When we're saying, in Jesus' name, sickness, go, we are agreeing with the report that it has happened. We're staying on what Peter said. It has happened. We are already healed. It's not coming. We already healed. Now, because it's we already healed, we're kicking that sickness out. Amen? And so, as you start doing that, every time you come in contact with food, you see it, you smell it, you see you see it driving down, you know, like an advertisement for a restaurant. It's just, it's a reminder what Jesus has done for you. I am healed by his stripes. Jesus, I thank you that your body was broken for me. Amen? That is part of our divine health. And we practice and participate and partake in communion continuously. Not once a Sunday. We do that to remind you all the time. But this has to be something that is continuous. This is your spiritual food that will keep you going. Amen? Okay, so let's eat our cracker. So how many of you got two crackers? See, I said God is good and I got two. I didn't ask for two, I got two. Just saying, it works. And then in 20, it says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So Jesus' blood was shed for us. The forgiveness of our sins has already happened. So when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, his blood paid the price for all of our sins, and we enter into the covenant. So this is our covenant. So every time that we take communion, every time that we remember, so like every time that you drink something, you remember, you say, Father God, I thank you that Jesus died for me on the cross. His blood was shed for me. All of my sins were forgiven. And I entered into a covenant with Jesus Christ. And now I have a covenant with you through Jesus Christ. And just like Jesus, this covenant with God cannot be broken, is there anything that Jesus can do to break the covenant? No. So as long as you're in Christ, and this is the key here, right? So you have Christ, and as long as you're in him, and you decide where you're at, you can be in him or out of him. That goes back to what you believe. If you're in him, you have a covenant with God that is unbreakable. That means that whatever you're doing, cannot break that covenant. The only thing that can happen is if you decide to renounce Jesus and walk away and go serve Buddha or something, then you're no longer in his covenant. But when you're in a covenant with Jesus, even when you make mistakes, Father God can never be angry with you because you're in a covenant through Jesus Christ. So that means that if you're in his covenant, the Bible says you're hidden him. So when you're speaking out of here, who does he see? Jesus. Can he ever be angry with Jesus? No. So that means he's always happy with you. Imagine how powerful the truth is, that he is always happy with you. Even if you messed up, you went out and you kicked your dog and you yelled at your cat and you think, oh man, God must hate me. That's a lie. Say, devil, I messed up. That is not who I am. I'm hidden Christ, so God is happy with me. That is a very powerful truth. Guilt and condemnation comes from not understanding that we're in a covenant with Jesus Christ. When we start believing that, the Bible says that there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
So how much condemnation are we supposed to have? Zero. Okay? So that means, repeat after me, I have, I have zero, condemnation. zero condemnation. I have no more guilt, I have no, more guilt. No, more condemnation. no more condemnation. When God looks at me, he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus. And, he and he is happy with me continuously, continuously. 24, hours a day. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, seven days a week. 365 days in a year, 120 years. years. That's it. That's the peak. When you reach 120, you'll go in heaven. So that means it can never run out. So God's happiness, you just declared that God's happiness cannot run away from you. You see what you guys just did? You proclaim that you believe the report that there is no more guilt and condemnation for you and that God is always happy with you. So that means going forward, if there's ever a thought that God is mad at you, you say, no, devil, you're a liar. On Sunday, I declared that God is happy with me. And I stand on that report, and I continue to declare it. And every time that you do communion, every time that you drink something, you remember what you said and continue saying it over and over again. And if you do that, if you partake in communion continuously throughout the day, guilt and condemnation will have nothing to do with you. Probably one of the most tormenting things that people experience is guilt and condemnation. And God wants it to be gone. He wants it to be wiped out. He does not want you to have any of it. It's all of the devil. Because he is the accuser of the brethren. Amen? So repeat after me. Father God, I thank you. you. Jesus' blood, blood was shed for me. I am forgiven. I am made whole. I am clean. You remember none of my sins. It cannot be even a possibility for you to remember it. You see me as Jesus. And you're happy with me all the time. Amen. Okay. Now, if you're wondering how come I wait went for so long, it's because I had to preach last Sunday's sermon too. We did not have service. So I had so much stuff to build up to share with you, so I'm sorry we went over a little bit, but hopefully it's worth it. If you will apply it, your life will drastically be changed.